are with Lindsay Diamond of Diamond Fabrics and Fibers, and she is going to show us how to make her pony pockets. And now many of you are familiar with these. You can transport them uh, to shows in your car. If you're moving, they're these really cute little cotton pouches you put your horses in. Today, Lindsay's going to show us how to make a stable mate size scale. And I will let you take it away, Lindsay. Hey, everyone. Um, so happy to be here today. Thanks so much for, um, thank you so much, Briar, for letting me do this. I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. Um, so it really, pony pockets are a lot of fun because if you turn into a fabric hoarder, like I am, um, <laughs> you can end up with a lot of fun fabrics and you can really kind of find like a personality for your show string. Like if you have, um, or if you have a theme, if you really like horses, like many of us do, if you have pets, if you've got certain colors or flowers or anything you like, um, it's fun because you can go and find a lot of the fabrics and everything that will kind of customize to your stable and find out what makes you, what makes you happy with it. Um, I have a large assortment of fabric <laughs> that I've collected over the last few years since I started making pockets and, um, uh, I've made some pockets for some various shows, um, so different artists that have been at Briarfest and the Artisan Gallery, and um, it's been a lot of fun. I just did some bags. Um, the Resin Futurity just got their bags that they're going to be sending out for prizes for the show. Um, been working on those for a couple of years now, so it's a lot of fun, and it's a nice little stress reliever because you can just sit down at your sewing machine and crank these pockets out for yourself, for your friends, and kind of customize them the whatever way you like. So uh, I'm excited to show you guys what we got going today. So um, Kat had found this adorable little fabric too that um, she used in her picture. And um, so we've got that. I'm going to use in that today. alyssa has got it there. It's um, so, super cute fabric. It's so cute. I love this fabric. And it's like, it's the perfect little Halloween or kind of fall themed fabric for today. So basic supplies, obviously you're going to need your sewing machine. Um, you'll need your main flannel or you can use cotton as well. Um, a lot of the bags that I do start with just a normal cotton fabric. Um, your inside lining piece that's going to go up against your horse is going to just be a plain white flannel. Um, my friend and I who make bags have found this works the best in regards to OF as well as customs and resins because it doesn't um, adhere, like if the weather gets a little iffy, it's not going to stick to your models at all. So, um, we've looked at other options. I do also do some, um, sometimes with a satin as well, just, it's a little bit smoother, nicer to use, a little more expensive. So it depends on your, on your budget for what you're going to make with. And then we also use the quilt batting, um, that is going to give the cushioning for the, for the bag itself. So I have, um, I kind of feel this up when I go to the craft store to make sure that what I'm getting is nice. This is a midweight um, batting that I found. Um, I just buy this by the yard off of the big rolls that they have at Joanne's. So I'm carrying around a giant four foot tall roll of batting that sometimes is, you know, huge round and it just kind of looks silly walking to it. But you get this stuff, cut it up, works great. And now um, do you get all of your fabrics and quilts and batting uh, from Joann's or are there any other craft stores that people can go to that have fabrics readily available? 90% yeah. of what I get comes from Joann's. Um, it tends to have the biggest selection in regards to the type of fabric available, the designs available. Um, they also have a lot of coupons um, when you're looking in the app. Um, they have some great sales, especially around Black Friday. Um, they'll do blowout sales and do stuff. Um, I They were doing a lot of last chance sales coming up um, or like earlier this year that I kept going in there. I was like, okay, I can't go look at the fabric. I'm just here for the batting or the flannel. And I walk by the aisle and like 10 minutes later, I have my arm full of bolts. <laughs> Because because I found oh, you really always end up going in for one thing and you end up come up with twenty ten yes. things yeah <laughs> it's horrible um, so yeah Joanne's a lot of the time is where I shop um, Hobby Lobby does have a great selection of fabrics um, I will tend to get my Velcro from there because Joanne's doesn't have a large um, selection of the colored Velcro so if you want anything other than white or black um, I will do Hobby Lobby for that I'll also do Amazon. Um, because I can get bulk packs and like me get like 12 colors all in one for a really good price. Um, 
Michael's doesn't have fabric as much. They are starting to carry a little bit more, but it's nothing that is as good of a selection as say like Joanne's and Hobby Lobby has. Um, online retailers such as Spoonflower, um, they'll have a lot of custom fabrics. You can like, if you have a design that you wanna make into a custom fabric, you can do that on Spoonflower. There's, um, and they have a lot of selection of other things as well in there too. I haven't explored that as much just because it is a little bit pricier. I look for the good deals so that I can get a larger quantity to be able to make bags more at once um, when I'm looking for the fabric. So I don't need to buy any more fabrics right now. I just need to get the flannel, the white flannel on the inside and the batting to keep working with the stuff that I have. But um, so those are the primary places. Other locations, um, at least here in Wisconsin where I'm at, those are the only hobby store options that we have. I know there are a lot of other probably fabric stores in different parts of the country that may have those options as well. I just don't have those availability here. Yes. So um, first pieces or first steps once we know what size we wanna make. So I've got everything cut out here. I'll just show you how we layer everything together. We're gonna to start with the batting. Um, when we are looking at our flannel pieces for the, um, for the lining and the top pieces, there is a right side and a wrong side to the fabric. So for the white flannel inside, there's kind of a little bit of a fuzzier side. And then the side that's a little bit kind of like a flat texture, you can kind of see the weave of the pattern a little bit more. So that fuzzier side is going to be the, what we call the right side of the fabric. So that we're going to lay onto our batting and pop this up here. So that's going to be, we're just going to line it up nice and square on everything there. And then when it comes to our outside fabric, we're gonna take, obviously this is gonna be our right side. This is the wrong side of the fabric. So the side that is more vibrant, that's gonna lay down right on top of that flannel. And then we're okay, just making so sure- Okay, so you that lay it down, picture the bright colored picture side down. Down, yep. So we're gonna, the majority of our seaming is gonna end up on the inside of the bag so you're not seeing the visible seams on the outside until we are sewing it closed at the very end. Um, next then, we'll grab our trusty pins. Um, if you have critters around, I always recommend making sure that you keep this covered. Um, try not to drop them on the floor so that our kitties and puppies and whatever other animals we may have aren't stepping in anything. So we're gonna go ahead and pin this. I use, I have one pre-pinned here that um, I'll just use like three on each side. It's enough to kind of keep things secure on here, but it's not going to create any kind of bunching. So I'm going to take my pins and I'm going to put it so the point is going out. Um, so it ends up with the point out. It What happens when you do that is that it's pushing the fabric out towards the edge. So it's keeping everything nice and taut and keeping it firmly in place. So I'm just going to keep pinning this around. And so what happens if it's not quite as taut? Say you didn't, one of your pins or parts of the fabric isn't as taut as say the other, around the other five pins. Is that gonna yeah. mess you up later it won't, on? It won't, no, it won't. You may end up with like a tiny little crease on the seam of it, but it's nothing that's going to completely affect the outcome of the bag. You just may have a little wrinkle in it. Not a huge deal. I've done plenty of those where all of a sudden I realize that, oh crap, I've now got a little spot here that's gonna, end up with a little wrinkle to it, but um, once it's in there, then you're good. Um, when you're working with a, a, a fabric that has a distinct pattern to it, so you have something like this where clearly this is up, this is down, there are two ways now that we can um, start sewing this together. If you want, when you're closing your pocket up, if you want it to be so that when you're looking at the front of the pouch where the flap is, if you want the fabric to be right side up, um, we're gonna start sewing because we have a little seam that ends up, um, because we have, to leave, we have to leave a hole in this to be able to flip everything inside out. So you can either sew it starting on that side so that you'll have a little seam there on the inside and your fabric is right side up. Or if you don't mind, like say if you want that pattern to be correct on the back side of it, then we're just gonna start sewing um, what we'll call like the upside down end. So just depends on what your preference is. Um, if you are doing something like I have, um, I'll use my Cricut and I'll put logos or I'll put names or something on one side or the other. So that will kind of determine on which way I'm gonna end up sewing this together. If I want the pattern to look right where I'm gonna put something from my Cricut on there, I'll sew it so that the flap everything looks upside down in here. 
If I want it the other way, where I'm not going to have something on there, then it's just going to be like that. Purely your preference, whatever you want to do with it. If you've got a pattern that goes every which way, you can start on whichever end and we'll go from there. So we'll get, I'm going to grab my one that I pinned before. I'm going to do these starting so that my front side of it is going to be um, the, the pattern right side up when I start there. So we're going to bring this in. Do you have a specific type of sewing machine are you using or any generic sewing machine is uh, good for this type of uh, workshop that you're doing? Um, pretty much any machine is good. It's always helpful if you plug it back in. Um, <laughs> I have um, a Singer patchwork, um, I forget what the actual model number is on it, but it has a lot of options in regards to um, different thread, um, like how you're gonna, how your thread's oh, wow. gonna look. We're just gonna be using a very basic straight stitch today. Um, just the, your basic stitch of anything you're ever gonna have. There's zigzag stitches. There's some different fun, like kind of embroidery different stitches. This one also does buttonholes. If I ever need us to do um, like a personal item, like if I wanted to make a shirt or something that I would need buttonholes for, it's got that option available to do buttons on there. Um, it also has this extendable table on it too, which is helpful for keeping your material and your sewing project flat. And this comes off if I were doing something with sleeves or a very narrow circumference, this pops off and then you would just have this arm that can go around it. Um, so it makes it a little easier to get like a hole something in there than goes in there. So um, I've also decorated my um, machine with stitch stickers because I have probably a very unhealthy obsession with Lilo and Stitch. And yes, my machine is actually- Now you gotta make it, it yours. <laughs> it's, yeah, so it's, it's named Stitch. It's something fun to do. <laughs> I love um, it. So I already have my threads uh, set on here. We, I'm gonna go ahead and use, I've got an orange thread for my top thread. Um, so you can see a little there. And then I have uh, just a white bobbin set inside for that. I've had those preloaded. Um, when you're sewing it, when you're starting it on the inside like this, it really doesn't matter what colors you're using because all of this is gonna be flipped to the inside. So if you had something preloaded from another project, and it's purple and blue and your fabric is like today with oranges, doesn't matter. You're not gonna see any of this. So if you have, or if that might just be the only thing you have lying around, you can start it like that. It's super easy to do. When I start sewing this, I'm gonna start about maybe an inch or so on away from the end on here because I do need to leave room to be able to pull the bag inside out once I finish sewing it closed. So I'm gonna start it. Um, and then I'm using my actual presser foot from the sewing machine itself to kind of be my gauge as far as how far from the edge I'm sewing it. And per my machine, um, the little plate that's on here, it shows that it's about a quarter of an inch um, for a seam allowance, what we call the uh, piece of the, the fabric that's left between the actual seam and the edge of the fabric that's called your seam allowance. And so do you think we're just for gonna... someone doing this the first time. Do you think mm -hmm. leaving a little bit of a bigger opening at the top might be yeah. a little helpful for them at first until they get yeah. used to flipping it? Yeah. So as much open as you can, an inch on either side, since this fabric is six inches long, should give you roughly about four inches. Um, it's going to be a narrow hole anyway because it's on a smaller pocket. The bigger ones I can usually end up leaving probably like five or six inches. Then I can get my whole hand in there to be able to okay. pull everything out. But it's also a bigger pocket, so there's more fabric that we're going to be pulling through as well. Um, so, yeah, so starting at about an inch, and then we're just going to get that fabric lined up under there. I'm going to get my presser foot down, and then we're just going to go ahead and um, when we start sewing it here, I'm going to sew a couple stitches and then I'm going to use the reverse button on my machine to backtrack over the stitches. It's um, called back tacking and just helps lock those initial stitches in place so that everything stays in place um, and just locks everything in. Just a really quick, um, like any sewing project will do something like that. It'll have you start it, back a couple stitches and then continue on. And then I've gotten to my corner. Whenever you're turning your fabric, no matter what project you're doing, we're always gonna leave that needle down because it's gonna anchor that project in place as I spin it. And then everything is set. So everything just stays right in place. As I sew along the sides that have the pins, I am gonna pull out each pin before I get to it. So that way we don't want the needle of the machine to hit the pin. It can damage the needle, it can break the needle. Um, it can bend your pins up if you're not careful. 
um, can do a lot worse damage to the machine as well. So we're just gonna go nice and slow and just initially and I'm right up to it. So I'm just gonna pull that pin out really quick, put it in my cup, right down the side. And so Lindsay, how did you get into making these pony pockets? Uh, one of my best friends in the area got me started on this. Um, it was just kind of a little extra hobby, little part that I thought might be fun to do. Um, I did some sewing projects when I was in 4-H, when I was in grade school, and um, had made a couple of things here and there, but nothing or like major like I haven't I would like I have a couple of patterns that I'd like to use to actually make um, my own shirts I have some fabric that I want to turn into a shirt at some point um, again that I found at Joanne's during a holiday sale it's a really cute unicorn fabric um, just haven't had a chance to get to it yet so just decided it was something to do I had a beat up um, sewing machine that I found at Goodwill for $13 that miraculously came with the instruction manual with all of the accessories. I mean, it had everything, um, but the machine was probably from the mid to early eighties. Oh, wow. <laughs> Surprisingly, it still worked great. It, it worked well for what I needed to really start. Um, it just got to a point where some of the gears inside were starting to wear out. Um, the rubber gears that are in there was wearing everything out and um, couldn't really handle the bulk of how much I was starting to sew and everything. So, um, I found this one at Joanne's per my friend's recommendation. She has the same machine. Um, there's up in Green Bay, there's a, a superstore Joanne's, which has a lot more options, larger fabric selection. They have an actual section in their store where you can test out the sewing machines to see what you like, what you don't like. So oh, you can really cool. make a good informed decision about what you're buying. Um, but she had been sewing a lot longer than I had. And she recommended this one. She liked it a lot. Um, so I just decided to go with that and um, it's been working great ever since. So no complaints so far. And now when you're sewing the bottom side, you can do a complete sew all the way through. You don't have to leave another nope. hole. Yeah, just all the way down. Um, Cause there's nothing special about that other side that we don't have, that we have to worry about. It's just gonna be a straight across. Um, that gets, we trim and everything gets tucked in there. So I got this next short side here. Let's pull that pin out. Now, if you don't have a sewing machine, can, is there a way that you can do it with needle and thread? I mean, obviously it might take longer. Um, it would take longer. Um, I know that there are some little like handheld sewing machines that you can get that would do, cause really all we're doing here is really basic, just straight stitching all the way around. There's nothing complicated that we're doing where it would require like any of those fancy stitches that I showed that this machine has. Um, anything complicated or like specialized um, feet or needles or anything else on the machine that you would need to use. So there's the hand options available. If you had something and you just wanted to do a quick sewing it together, you could even just do, if you didn't want to get all of the pieces involved, you could just simply grab a piece of fabric, fold it in half, and you could just take your, um, take your needle and thread and just do, um, I'm not sure exactly what the stitch is called, but just going like around and just looping it around the edges okay. um, to make it really easy because if you just need something that's just a little quick, hey, I need to store this horse or hey, I just need to like do something with it fast, that's easy enough to do something as well. Something you wouldn't and, need as much padding for. Yeah, exactly. Like if it's just a quick, um, you know, like, oh, I just need to pack horses to move them out of this room while remodeling is being done. Um, towels also work great for that. Uh, old t-shirts as well. When I was moving, that was some of my packing material because I ran out of my own pockets to use. <laughs> okay. And just so, uh, just for the, some of the new people who are joining yeah. us, uh, mm -hmm. this, the type of stitch you're using, it's called a straight stitch, it's correct? A base, very basic straight stitch. You can alter the lengths of your stitches as well on your machine. Um, I think mine is just kind of set to like a very kind of basic, um, I think it's a two and a half length. Um, your, the good thing is a lot of the new modern machines are gonna come with instruction manuals that'll describe to you about um, the length of stitch, um, tensions on the machine. There's a lot of technical stuff. Mine is pretty just an auto setup. I took it out of the box. I got it set up and started rolling from there to make it pretty easy. 
So um, I've gotten back around to the top side where we started. I'm going to just go again, just about an inch or so in. So we're gonna leave enough room for me to get my hands in here and turn that fabric around. We did a little back tagging on this side to secure those stitches in place. Just bring my presser foot up, grab scissors, and we're just gonna go ahead and cut that off. I'm gonna also trim off these threads that I started with from the other side, um, just getting everything off of there. And now we have, so we can see on here, it's gone ahead and we've just got that nice edging around it. This is what it looks on the back side. Um, I have white thread in, so it's kind of hard to see on that edge of it, but from there. Um, next step, we're gonna get this ready to flip. I'm gonna grab my little bit bigger scissors. These corners on here, um, because as we flip, we don't want this extra bulk that's gonna be in the corners here. So I'm just gonna take my scissors and I'm just gonna cut this um, just at kind of a, just an angle across and get some of the excess fabric off. So it's gonna end up looking like that. We're gonna do that on all four corners. When I am doing a lot of bags at once, I actually have my cutting mat and a rotary cutter that I will use cause it'll go a lot quicker. Um, I'll trim off a little bit more excess fabric too if I say maybe overshot when I was cutting it and it got a little bit bigger, but we're just gonna end up with all four corners. Just got those nice little angles on there. And then one little piece of trimming that we're gonna do on this edge where we have our opening, I'm just gonna kind of fold this fabric back a little bit so we can see there's some excess of the batting. We're gonna actually trim some of this away so that when we are ready to sew that hole closed, we don't have a lot of extra bulk on there. So it's gonna be a lot easier to sew it shut. So I'm just gonna grab my scissors here and we're just gonna trim down nice and easy like that. So now when I let this fabric go, we can see there's a lip here, a little excess there. It makes it nice and easy. Okay. And now the fun part for the flipping. This is where you find out how big your hands really are. I usually, <laughs> when I do these, I can get, if I'm careful with the stitching, sometimes I can get more of my hand in. I'm just gonna insert a few fingers in here and I'm just gonna kind of wrinkle up, get down to that far end. I'm gonna try and grab one of the corners to start pulling that through first. Okay. And then we're just gonna pull it and it gets nice and satisfactory. Oh, you make that look so simple. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of practice. Um, so I can see now I've still got a little bit of bulk from that other end where I pulled it through. I'm just gonna push my fingers back in here and we're gonna just push these corners out and kind of get everything pushed out with my fingers. Okay, to smooth out the bottom a little. To smooth everything out. One thing I like to do with these corners too, that's kind of like, um, it's like a little sensory thing. So you can kind of see there's like a little bit of bulk in the corner. It's not quite square. We're not gonna get square, but I'll kind of just take and like massage these corners and that kind of like roll them and it ends up pushing that excess fabric to the corner out and makes it just comes out a little bit nicer. And then you have some nice clean edges to kind of put. You can also get um, corner pushers that they have available as well. Um, with the smaller ends, it's sometimes a little bit easier, but you can use these to get into the corners to help push out as well. Um, depending on the fabric, you wanna be very careful with this because this is a little bit sharper of an end. Um, not sharp, but a little more pointed. So um, if you're using a little bit more of a um, fragile, fabric, you would want to be careful with that. But I like just kind of massaging. It just makes it, it's kind of satisfactory to just smooth everything out. So now we've got it flipped. We got those corners looking nice and smooth. Very good. Now um, we're going to go back to our pins a little bit again. And when we have this excess fabric here in order to flip it so that we can sew it closed, I'm going to kind of fold that white flint on the inside well, it might be easier on this side. Depends on how much you manage to actually take off of the batting to make sure it's good. We're gonna fold that in and then we're gonna fold these edges in as well so that you're gonna end up with just a nice flat seam like that. This is where he kind of maneuvers around a little bit, kind of push everything down in, get it looking nice and flat. And this is where you find out too, if you can actually sew straight because you hopefully end up with a nice clean line across the top that's flat as you sew it closed. We're gonna take our pins and then, let's see. Get mine tucked and in just here. as a reminder, if people are yeah. joining us now, um, mm -hmm. you can go on in the chat on the YouTube link and you can ask Lindsay any questions if you're following along, if you're going to uh, watch this later, if you have any questions yeah. in the future, definitely pop those questions in that chat and I will get them to Lindsay. Absolutely. 
Um, so I'm just kind of getting that tucked in. I'm going to take my pin. We're going to kind of do the same. This time our pins are going to go facing towards the inside of the fabric again, because we want to making sure we're catching both of these edges as we're folding it. And it's just going to sit just like this. So it's just going to sit in there flat. It catches that backside in um, just to get all of those raw edges tucked inside. Sometimes it depends on how big your hole is. Um, if you want to really, if you're really tucking everything in to make sure that it's nice and secure, I'll do probably three or four pins across this just to make sure everything is nice and tidy in place. Here we go, one more. <clears throat> all right. There we go. All right, so I ended up with four pins in there just to make sure that it's all nice and tight straight across on the back there. And then we're just gonna sew this closed, nice and easy. Um, I set this up purposely on this way so that my orange fabric for my top thread is going to be sewing across the top of it. The white's gonna be on the back. If you want contrast across here, you could flip it so you could have white going across there. Um, with this particular fabric, black would be cute, a brown would be cute. Um, anything that kind of matches what's in there but would still show a little contrast with it. I'm just gonna close it up and I'm just gonna, because this is a small bag, I'm just actually gonna sew straight across this whole piece then I know it catches everything on there. So you'll have a little bit more of a seam showing but I know everything is gonna be tacked down. Everything is staying perfectly in place. Okay, so you're gonna re go, oh, you're gonna go over the okay. one inch corner that yeah. you did in the beginning. Yeah, just to get everything nice and closed up. This one is also gonna be a narrower um, seam allowance. I wanna try and catch as close to this edge as I can without completely missing it, just because there's less fabric that we tucked inside. So I wanna make sure that everything is caught with the thread as it goes through. So I'm using, it's like with the way my presser foot is, it's it's like pretty close to the edge of the fabric. And so I'll go a little bit slower on this one because I wanna make sure that everything gets caught. Down. Do that little bit of backtracking again to make sure that everything is tucked in secure. And then just go across. I'm gonna go nice and slow so I have enough opportunity to carefully pull my pins out. So as I, right as I get to it, I'll pull the pin out so that it keeps everything tucked in, but I'm not going to worry about hitting that pin as I sew it. Cool. And Lindsay, when you're making these, what have you found a specific scale that you find you tend to make more of? What's your, you know, what's your favorite scale to make, or do you kind of just make them as needed? A lot of times I make as needed. Um, if I'm trying to build up a stock when I want to sell things, um, a lot of people like traditional size. Um, I have two main sizes of traditionals, um, just like a regular traditional pouch, which will fit some of the smaller molds that Briar has. So like the Proud Arabian Mare, um, Lady Faze, some of the newer releases. Um, I think on my shelves here who we've got, um, just some of the other ones like that. A large traditional bag is going to fit some of the bigger horses. So like Fireheart or the Cleveland Bay, um, my favorite model, because I've got my <laughs> 30 some hiding on the shelf you have quite the here. collection back there <laughs> like that um my boys as i love them to call them um and then we do i do have some extra large ones to fit mods like um ademic um yasmin will fit in those larger ones so the really long ones that we have to worry about kind of getting in there um Stable mate ones are obviously gonna be great for our stable mates. I've done some smaller stuff for mini winnies, not as many, just maybe like a couple of specialty things. We also do, my friend and I do bags um, to fit the classics um, and like full size. So okay. like we have a small and a large full size that we'll use to fit like anything say from Bouncer to Henry the Fjord to um, some of the smaller foals like the standing lip is on full or um, some of the other ones. So like kind of in that size as well. I've also come up with a couple of sizes that are like a venti scale for some of the artist resin pieces that are out there that as we're, as we're expanding our scale size that's out there, this is super easy to like kind of flex and be like, okay, I have this horse. 
what size bag do I need it to be so that it will comfortably fit in the bag? It's not too big. It's not too small. So you don't have to worry about rubs, but you don't have to worry about it sliding around in there as well. So that, um, you know, could potentially get rubs that way as well. Um, I was working with Heather Bullock on some of the bags that or some of the models she's been working on. And we came up with that newer venti size because we have oh. a curio scale as well that would fit some of the collectas, but they were just a smidge too small for some of the new artist releases that are out there, but yet a small full bag was way too big for it. So the horse kind of moved around in there too much. So um, it's pretty flexible. If you have a specific horse that you want to bag for, you can take your fabric, lay it on a table, grab your horse, see how wide you need it to be. You can kind of figure out how tall you need it to be. Um, you know, and when you're looking at, because obviously like, so our measurements with this being the 13 inches, we're looking at having the be able to fold over um, you know, we're getting it in half and then having probably like a couple inches, inch and a half ish or so to be able to fold over. So, you know, the height of it is going to be roughly a little under half of the height that you're making the bag to start with, because we're going to be folding it in half to making that pocket. So yeah, just depends on what size you need. Um, I have behind my iPad here, I have two big shelves in my bedroom that stacks all of my flannel and fabric and everything out so that I can just, I can go on a little spree. I'll cut a whole bunch of batting at once. I'll cut a whole bunch of flannel at once. I'll cut a whole bunch of fabric at once, lay it out by size on the shelves. And I have them labeled. So I know this is a regular traditional. These are large traditionals. Here's the large full, here's small folds. Here's the stable mate size. And then I can just, okay, I've got a day off of work. I don't have any other pressing projects. I'm going to come and just get a whole bunch of things sewn together in like this first step. And oh, then my next- nice. I'll do it in kind of stages so that it's, I don't get too overwhelmed by it sometimes. So I'll do a whole bunch of them and just get them to this stage. And then, you know, maybe that's my mental limit for the day. That's all I want to cover for, for the day. I'll come back another day and I'll trim all the excess off and I'll trim the corners and get them, um, get that little edge here closed or like trimmed up so that I can close them and then I'll flip them and then I'll be done with that for the day. Um, I'll sort things out by color. So if I am going to be doing a certain color scheme with threads, I can just do a whole bunch of them all at once so that I'm not changing my thread every five, 10 minutes, depending on what's going on as well. So works out pretty well. Velcro. Sometimes the nice part, because it's fun to see it coming together. Also, sometimes my most hated because it's a lot of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. <laughs> But so Velcro, as you guys know, has two sides. You've got that soft fuzzy side and then you've got the rough side with the hooks on it. When we're putting these together, that edge that we just sewed closed, this is where we're gonna put the rough side of our Velcro on the outside of the fabric because we never wanna have the chance that this can come into contact with our models because we don't wanna worry about anything scratching up. So I'm going to just, I kind of eyeball these up a little bit. Um, to give us room for closing everything up, I'm gonna put it roughly about like this far from the edge of the bag. And I wanna tuck it up as close as I can to that top seam of the bag. He's sitting on top of the pumpkin, let me try on this side. So it's gonna be about like that. And then we're just gonna do the same thing as we were doing, again, it's just a lot of straight stitching. We're gonna go kind of on that very edge of the fabric or the edge of the Velcro. Um, just gonna do a couple little quick start stop stitches at the beginning to tack down the Velcro. And right on the edge, backtrack. So and now, if you bought the um, stick on Velcro, can you use that as well? Or do you have a preference of using the Velcro that you actually sew on? Prefer the stuff to sew on. And this is great because I just got a thread jam on here. Um, the, the stick on Velcro, you just have to watch because you can also sew that on at the same time, but you're gonna end up, because it has all that adhesive on the back of the Velcro itself, you can end up with a lot of adhesive on your needle and your thread then, and that can kind of gum up the machine and gets a little bit more difficult sometimes to use, so you have to clean it a little bit more. Um, my thread just decided to tangle here, so we'll pull this out really quick. Um, so it comes preferential to use the stuff that is just strictly a sew on Velcro to make sure that um, for ease of using the machine, if you wanted to use the stick on stuff, like I think there is probably like an iron on Velcro as well. I haven't researched or used it at all, um, but that would be an option as well. Like again, if you didn't have the sewing machine and you wanted to do this, um, you could definitely use that 
um, that stick on or an iron on Velcro so that there's an easier way for you to get it on there. And we'll just cut this out. I figure that my machine would give me trouble at one point here. Just getting some of this excess thread off from my machine deciding to snag on me there. There we go. All right. Sometimes the Velcro hooks catch and it like tangles things up weird. So we're just going to restart. There we go. And I know you mentioned you were backtracking over the Velcro. Um, mm-hmm. Do you, you're preferring to backtrack as it, does it add that extra layer to it or does it just close it? It closes um, the stitches in and makes sure that everything is just staying. It kind of locks everything in place. Okay. So yeah, literally probably almost, I can think of maybe like a couple little projects and I'm just rolling up my excess to fit through my machine here. Um, there may be like a couple of cases in sewing projects where you wouldn't do anything like that. Um, if you're using something to just kind of hold something in place gently while you're going to be doing some other sewing on the project. Um, but that's, like I said, that's just, and that's, so it ends up just being a temporary stitch to hold something in place versus with this, we want this to stay in place. So we're just going to go ahead and just, we just backtrack over our starting and our finishing stitches locks everything in and don't have to worry about that coming off in the future. We're just gonna snip these threads nice and close. And then we're gonna go ahead and sew on the other piece of the rough sided Velcro first. Um, So we'll get those pieces done and then we will go on to the smooth stuff. So then for this with the cross, and we're just gonna line it up that little distance from the end close to the top, making sure that they're mostly aligned across the top um, and straight and even. And we just slide that in. You can pin the Velcro in place too. Um, I find I just, um, like if you wanted to do that all at once where you can pin everything in place so it's all set to go. If you're doing like a big stack of pockets and you just wanna get everything set and ready to go and then you would just pull out that pin as you started each piece of Velcro again so you don't have to worry about hitting the pin as you, um, start sewing the presses down. So with the small pockets, I use two pieces of Velcro on here and it holds everything down pretty well. With our larger pockets that my friend and I do, we'll use three pieces across. So we've got one in the middle and just helps keep everything, keeps Give everything extra nice support. Little, bit, little extra support to close it in there too. Um, when I did a couple of the mini Winnie ones, I would just put like one piece because the pocket is, you know, maybe this big in general. So it's pretty small. And sometimes I'll even with that end up um, maybe cutting the Velcro down to a one inch piece instead of using the one and a half, just to kind of scale things down to whatever size you're making. And now when you're stitching the Velcro, what if you say you make a mistake? Is there a way to undo that at that point? Or do you just try and uh, work um, from there and yeah. correct your so, mistake as you continue. Yeah. So like what just happened with my machine with the thread getting a little bit tangled up, I just grabbed my, um, seam ripper. Um, this is my goose that my best friend gave me for my birthday this year. He's got a man. <laughs> so he's just, my oh, little, that's very cute. Little mascot here. Um, they're, they've been so popular, but it's the perfect little spot to keep that. So I'm not digging it out of my bag. Um, I'll just go in there and just seam rip and just pull those threads out. And then I was able to just to go ahead and restart that little piece again. Okay. Um, so that it was easy enough to get off. Uh, I'm gonna switch my bobbin thread here because as I do these next pieces, the orange is gonna go on the inside on this white side, but I want orange on the top piece here. This is gonna be my bottom thread that I'm changing the colors so that it matches um, the thread. Again, if you want a contrasting color here, you can put in whatever contrasting color you want. And you just thread your bobbin according to the machine instructions. They all pretty much operate about the same way, um, putting it in so that the thread comes off in a particular direction. And then it just comes up and you slide it out. There we go. Um, but you can use the same thread if you, if you yeah, want to keep if, it off. If you're if just you saying just, using yep. white, you can just use white thread or black exactly. thread. It's, The nice thing about pockets, you can do whatever you want with these. It doesn't have to be matchy matchy. You can have fun doing contrasting. Um, I did some bags that had, I forget what color it was, like the main fabric, but I had a, like a brighter, vibrant color to contrast um, when we sewed up the side seam. So you could see it there. 
um, you could see it on the Velcro pieces a little bit. Sometimes I'll match, I'll, like I've got, this orange isn't quite a perfect match, but um, you know, you can see it's, it's, okay, it's pretty yeah. close to that orange. I will frequently, um, excuse me, if I'm looking for a particular color of thread to match the Velcro, I'll just take the Velcro with me to the store and just stand in front of the wall of thread and see what comes out, what works the best. Or if the same with the fabric, like, okay, do I have a fabric? Do I have a thread at home? Maybe let's just go over to the wall of thread. Thread, usually sometimes you can get a pretty good deal on threads as well, that sometimes Joann's will do a buy two, get three free or a buy three, get two, oh, wow. do some half off. Um, I, my sewing box of thread is kind of a mismatch of all of the colors right now. And then sometimes we'll be like, oh yeah, I know I have a lot of black and white. Oh, there's a sale going. Common colors that I use a lot is the black and white. So I'll just load up and I'll have extra spools all the time because there's nothing worse. Having a project of like 10 pockets that I've got to make for somebody and running out of thread at like the last pocket. Oh like, no. Okay. Got to run to the other side of town, go get more thread, get everything done. <laughs> it's like, man. So yeah, it's nice to stock up. <laughs> yes. Stock up sales are fantastic. So as I'm going to get the soft side of the Velcro lined up now, I'm just going to fold my pouch in half so I can kind of see where these pieces come up. And I'm just going to kind of eyeball line it up in place so I can see, okay. So when this flap closes over, this is going to line up on that one. All four corners are going to hit there. And then we're just going to do the same thing. It's the Velcro is very repetitive. So if I'm doing, if I do have something where I have to switch the colors, I'll do all the rough side at once on a whole bunch of bags. I'll then change my thread and then I'll do all the smooth side because nothing's worse than starting and stopping just to switch your thread all the time. So if you have a lot and you're doing different colors, that's why I organize them in different color schemes. So I know like, okay, I've got all these multicolor bags. I'm going to do white on these. I'm going to do purple on these. I'm going to do blue on these. And I'll have, just have stacks laid out on my bed to, okay, I'm going to get all these done. Then I can do these and swap everything in and out. Same thing, just backtracking on that thread a little bit to lock it all in place. And now this, since it's not the uh, rough side of the Velcro, your needle shouldn't get stuck as shouldn't much. Shouldn't get hung up on this, yeah. Those, the hook of the hook and eye closure definitely will get that sometimes. And I just, oh, okay, start, stop, pull it out, restart it, it comes out pretty good. So we around one more time, get my extra thread. We'll definitely say I have to be in the right mindset to do a day of Velcro just because it is the start and stop all the time that some days it's just too boring. Don't want to, don't want to look the at the most it. tedious part. <laughs> it is. It's very much the most tedious part. I will usually have, um, because I, with my work schedule, I usually miss a lot of live TV. So I'll usually have my iPod or my iPad and headphones and watching TV shows as I'm sewing, um, catching up on the current Master Chef season right now and um, getting caught up on that, movies, anything that kind of just like it breaks up that monotony of sewing a million little pieces of Velcro around certain stuff. I think I've probably watched the National Treasure movies at least probably watch all of them and 30 one, 40 times one go. <laughs> yeah, 30, 30 40 times I've probably like I can I can recite a lot of the lines for those movies um same for the devil wears Prada it's you find those good background noises that you don't have to pay attention to it it's not something new you can just kind of that comfort noise just to have something on um or definitely music too if I'm just in a music kind of day I'll just throw on something on Spotify or if I have a favorite artist that I like to pull out and just listen to and just enjoy for the day. And we do have a question. Um, so yeah. Asking why are you using multiple short pieces versus versus one long strip of Velcro instead? So you definitely can do that. I have found that when it comes to this, and I know like I had a bag a long time ago, I had one long one. So when it comes to just lining up like this, you're going to end up, um, it holds these corners down a little bit closer. Um, you certainly can. You're just going to end up then with probably like a five inch long piece of Velcro. It kind of is a bit more of um, savings because I can get more Velcro out of the hanks of Velcro. I can get more pieces done and everything versus if I had to use one long strip of this, I've only used 
three inches of Velcro on this, then say maybe a five inch piece on here. So I'm saving two inches of Velcro that I can use on other projects. But You're definitely, personal yeah. preference, if someone personal wants preference, to use a long strip, yeah. they can go ahead yeah, and use a long absolutely, strip. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If awesome. you wanted to do one inch pieces on here, you could do that as well. Um, yeah, just we, I can get more done out of um, a whole piece of a whole hank of Velcro if I do it in the smaller pieces versus one longer strip. So for me, it's just a cost saving for that matter. We're almost done with this. I'm super excited. So I know it's really cool seeing it all come together. We're good there. So what I do now, just to make sure that everything is lined up, is I'll just kind of fold in half. I line up my Velcro pieces and close it up, just to make sure everything is lined up. And then this is going to help me determine where that flat folds over, um, and where the bottom is going to end up being, and gets everything lined up. So I'll just kind of, so like right now, it's a nice little cuff for muff for winter, something like that. We're just going to take it. I'm just going to kind of crease it, kind of smooth it out. I want to make sure that my bottom piece is a nice and flat um, piece across here. We're not going to be sewing that, but I just like to crease it kind of finger and call it finger ironing, kind of crease it to hold it in place. And you can see I've got that fold over. Um, so I know that their pocket is going to be deep enough to hold my horse. Nothing should be sticking out on the top, but I know everything is going to hide in place. And this again, if like all my colors are kind of matchy matchy on this, I have some other bags that I did that I used a contrasting thread so you could see it a little bit more. Now we're just gonna sew up the sides. This is super easy to do. I'm just gonna hold everything in place. I'm gonna start at one end, just knocking it in here. And this is again, I'll use that edge of my presser foot on my sewing machine to kind of use for a seam allowance. I'm just gonna hold it in place, just straight stitching again. We're gonna go back over the bottom piece. I'm just where we started. There we go. Just gonna go slowly up the side, so I'm making sure that it's staying nice and straight. And how close do you want to be to the sides? So mine again is about per the markings on the machine. It's roughly maybe like maybe about a half inch down to like a quarter of an inch. I'll finish this one up so we can see what it looks like. Um, because we want to save like the maximum amount of room inside the pocket for the horse, but we don't want it too close that the seam would potentially come off, um, you know, our edges. So we're catching that edge there. Okay. And it ends up being nice and close and then it's just stitched down at the top and bottom. Then we're just going to flip it over so we can do that other side. Same thing. We're just going to go nice and close to that edge using that edge of my foot. There's just a little extra fabric right there. I got a little stuck. There we go. I'm just gonna pull it through. Sometimes depending on how much extra fabric you have underneath from when we folded it, um, you have to go in a little bit further just so it's the machine's like, hey, that's a lot of fabric. I can't sew through that. We need to be fair. Right. Final backtracking to lock everything in place. Cut the threads. This is always the satisfying part is going through and trimming all of your threads. Making sure everything awesome. goes away, making everything nice and clean. Pieces. Nice and extra clean. And you've got an adorable little pony pocket. Oh my goodness. Just like that. I've got some. This is adorable. Here. So I've got just a little stable mate resin up here. I'm just going to take so we can see. She just fits in there nice and easy. She's all nice and cozy for fall, ready to go, ready to go to a show in a couple of weeks. There's plenty of room inside for her that she's not anywhere near the top. Like if I fold it over, she's down in there nice and snug. She's got room on both sides to fit and then it just tacks in. And just like that, you've got a cute little pocket. That was so much fun. It's the super cute pockets, and you can pick yeah. any, it doesn't have to just be a fall pattern. If you want exactly. to do these for Christmas or exactly. Hanukkah or the upcoming holidays, any winter theme, that's super cute. I found this unicorn <laughs> flannel. This actually glows in the dark. So if you that get is it really charged cool. up enough, it will glow in the dark. Um, it was just, it was a super fun find. I almost was going to use this one today and then I saw the kitty fabric. Um, and I was like, well, the kitties with the pumpkins are pretty cute because I couldn't find any good horse themed fall fabric, but the kitties were pretty cute. I have my cat is sacked out on the bed behind me here, just chilling, <laughs> um, which is his usual position. He'll come up, he'll want some attention a little bit later and he'll come. So I have to snuggle in for a little bit or he'll be under my feet 
so I have to make sure I'm not kicking him as I'm <laughs> sewing throughout the day. But it's a fun little, you know, it's like, and it's something useful that you need for your horses. If you're going to shows, if you're packing for whatever reason, these are just so much fun to do. And it's just a nice EG project. You can see how quickly these work up. Um, so it's super nice if you've got a smaller herd that you need to pack, literally a smaller herd, um, makes it nice and easy. Um, if you have big ones that you want to do, then you just, you know, like I said, measure it out. Um, I actually found some perfect fabric, my last name being diamond that it's has diamonds all over it in different colors. And it says shine like a diamond. So my personal pockets are all these diamond fabrics that I have, um, to use for my own. And I have some other fun owls that I found that are like got reading glasses on and they're all kind of stern and proper, but yet very whimsical. Um, there's so much fun you can have with doing these too. I, I love it. It's, it is a lot of fun to do. And like I said, I've, I worked with some different artists and different um, people to make pony pockets for their things. Um, Mindy Berg, who has done some briar horses. We did um, some bags for her a few years ago with one of her resin releases. Um, Heather Bullock has them for her artisan gallery horses every last couple of years in the artisan gallery. And it's just a lot of fun. You, if you have a cricket or if you know someone that does, you can do some fun designs. If you have a studio logo, um, if you want to put horse names, if you want to say, okay, this is my specific pocket for this horse, you could print their name on there, iron it on, That's have cool. it done. So you can have a lot of fun customizing these and just doing a, whatever you're, you're only limited by if you can find the fabric and that's it. You can have a lot of fun with everything. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today and showing us all how to make these adorable pony pouches. Absolutely. Um, well, thanks thank again, you. guys. I appreciate it so much. Have a wonderful weekend.